glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. All right, thank you, B. Yeah, be seated if you can. I, I know that's a high mountain to come off of right there. That is so awesome. Thank you, guys. That is such a truth uh, of the Lord, how he works in our life and how he moves in our life. I'm going to sing my way out of all the hurt and the valleys and the pray, I'm going to praise my way. Uh, that's uh, biblical. That's what the Bible tells us to do. That's how we win the battles in our life. I know it doesn't seem like it, but how do you face an enemy that you can't see? You know, how do you defeat someone that you can't, that you can't, uh, you can't, can't challenge, you know? I mean, you can't take a pistol and shoot them. You can't take a bat and hit them. You can't take a knife and cut them. I mean, well, how are you going to, how are you going to defeat an invisible enemy? Well, Scripture says, hey, we have a spiritual battle that we're fighting, and, and God's given us the weapons to use, and if we use his weapons, we'll, be, we'll, we'll, we'll defeat the enemy. And if we don't, we won't. Uh, with that in mind, we've been in a series uh, out of the book of Daniel, uh, really about pride. Uh, and I know that for most people, when you, you get completely underwhelmed, you say, what in the world would somebody be preaching about pride for? I mean, out of all the things that you could probably choose to pick to share with people, why would pride be something worthy of our attention? Well, just as a reminder, I mean, it's just like one, one little thought about it. You know, the scripture says in the book of Psalms, it says, these six things the Lord hates, and yea, seven are an abomination to him. And what is the first one on the list? A proud look. <laughs> So I'm just saying to you that it's far more subtle than we think how the enemy deceives and how the enemy uses these types of things to defeat our lives, to take us into captivity, to put us into bondage, because the, the, the heart of this series is, in the book of Daniel, that, that while God has us in the process of being disciplined and in the process of being corrected, which is what's happening to Israel in the book of Daniel. They're in captivity for 70 years. It's called the exile, and God places them under four pagan kings that um, obviously uh, don't know him at all, and these kings are wonderful pictures of the enemy that we face as God tries to correct and discipline his children. At the same time, the enemy is trying to place God's children in captivity and in bondage. And the way that Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Great, he'll be the great deliverer next week, but, but the way they're trying to do this is by introducing into the life of God's people pride so that when they finally get delivered from Babylon, which they will, God will eventually bring them out of there after 70 years. Jeremiah told them, you're gonna be there 70 years. So they were there 70 years, one year for every year they stole from God. And we've been through all that. But the point being that when, when they finally did leave, what the enemy wants is for you to take some of Babylon with you. You know, and, and, and so it would affect the rest of your life. And so here in the book of Daniel, the enemy uses these four kings, um, Nebuchadnezzar, we looked at the first week to show us the seduction of pride. And you remember Nebuchadnezzar's life was filled with pride. He, uh, every time he seemed to kick out of pride by uh, creating a decree and a proclamation and just extolling the God of Daniel who read the hand, who, who interpreted his dream and told him what it meant. And man, he just, whoo, it was just unbelievable how he praised God and he just went all forward with, you gotta glorify God. Anybody that doesn't do it, they're gonna be killed and you know, you can't glorify any God except Daniel's God. And it looked like, okay, he's found, he's found. He's found the truth here. And just a few weeks later, he there he goes building a statue of gold, setting it up on the plains of Dura. Everybody's got to bow down when I, you know, when the Babylonian Beastie Boys or whoever it is now, when they play the music, you got to bow down to this statue. And, uh, and, and so, in other words, he just kept being drawn back into pride. Every time he would get out, he would just be seduced. He would be tempted right back into it. And that's the way pride is. And it, and it creates barriers in our life. And then 
then, of course, uh, Belshazzar is the next king of Babylon. And Belshazzar was the one that took the gold vessels out of the house of God and decided that one night in a drunken party that he and his, uh, his, uh, his men and his concubines and his wives, I mean, all of them, they'd just take the vessels of God from the temple that had been dedicated to God, and they would just use them for themselves. They'd drink wine out of them. They'd just party and had a good time. And, and, and God broke up the party because all of a sudden a hand appeared and just started writing something on the wall. And, of course, that shut the party down. And... and uh, and, and Daniel wasn't there, but they called Daniel in and said, hey, let, let Daniel come because he's, God's in him. He can, he's the one that can tell you what's going on. Daniel comes in there and God says, yep. Uh, he reads the writing. He says, mene, mene, to kill you, Farson, which means uh, your kingdom's been numbered. <laughs> you've been weighed into balances and you've been found wanting. And God has divided your kingdom to the Medes and the per uh, Persians. And that very night, the scripture says that Darius the Mede died that very night. And I mean, uh, uh, that Belshazzar died and Darius the Mede became the, uh, the king of, of Babylon. Well, with Belshazzar, we see the stubbornness of pride. And pride is a stubborn, you know, many of the stubborn things in our life, they're just nothing but pride. That's all there is. it is. And pride, pride causes us to reject and resist and to fail to grow. It's a, it, 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 it creates distance. It causes relationship issues. It's just, a, it's just an insidious little thing that's in the side of us, right? All right, so yeah, so now we have Darius. Darius the Mede comes in. He takes over in chapter six. He becomes the, the king and... Um, and, and he's going to have his part to play in this, uh, in, this, in this introduction of pride and captivity and bondage in the life of God's children. So uh, how did God's children stay free even though they were under oppression and, and under bondage? How did they stay free from this? Well, let's read verse 1, Daniel chapter seven, uh, 6. Excuse me. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 high officers. Some of you might remember the old King James word, satraps. Satrap. That's the way that that's the old King James language called these high officers satraps, which means uh, provincial governors. You know, smaller, not, not like a, a governor for a state, but a governor for a province. So anyway, high officers. To be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the high officers might, ac might account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So now Daniel is one of the top leaders of the country. Uh, which makes perfect sense because remember last week, Belshazzar gave him the robe and made him the third ruler of the kingdom and all of that stuff. Well, he's still there and everybody's recognizing, man, this guy's got something going on and here he is. He's, he's with the three governors. He's among the, the leaders. Then this, I love the way they say stuff like this Daniel. <laughs> you know what I'm and then this Daniel. Uh, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the high officers because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So now Daniel's about to get a promotion that's going to set him over, the, over all of the whole realm, over the other governors. The only one he'll be subject to is the king. So the governors and the high officers sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They, they, want to find him, they want to find him skimming money. They, they, they want to find him doing something illegal with the king's funds. They're trying to find something, some way he is, uh, he's misusing his power in the kingdom. That's, that's what they're looking for. But no, now notice, notice what, what they find. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. I mean, how would you like for that to be the conclusion of the job evaluation at the end of the year for your job? Uh, you, are, you are completely faithful. You are, you are totally trustworthy. And, 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 and you are uh, dynamically responsible for everything you take charge of. That's you. Well, that was Daniel. They found it. They, they could find nothing. Well, verse 5, then these men said, well... Uh, we shall not find any charge against this, against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. 
So we got to, you know, that's the only thing he really has that the king might get upset. He's, he, he's got this deal about his God now. I mean, he's going, he, he, you, if we don't find, we can, maybe we can use that. Well, verse six, so these governors and high officers thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever, which was a common greeting. All the governors of the kingdom. All right, now I just, I want to call this to your attention. I'm going to say something about it in just a minute. All the governors of the kingdom. What, what, what are they saying here? They're saying, all right, all the governors of the kingdom, about what we're about to tell you, all of the governors of the kingdom, we all agree on this. Now, I, I want you to notice, and I hope this jumps out to you as being a lie, because Daniel is the, is the governor. Daniel is the highest governor of the governors, and he didn't agree to this. And they're coming in and telling King Darius that all of the governors are a part of this. So Darius is thinking, okay, well, if it's all right with Daniel, it should be all right with me, you know. They come in and they say, all the governors of the kingdom, um, the administrators, the high officers, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, the reason I wanted you to notice that it took a lie to bring Daniel into bondage here to the king is because I want you to understand that the only way that Satan can take you into bondage or captivity is to get you to believe a lie. Yeah. Did you hear me? Yeah. The only way he can take you into captivity or bondage, and I'm talking about the way you think, the way you feel. I'm talking about the things you do because of the way you think and the way you feel. Look, if Satan's going to attack your marriage, you know what's he, what he's going to do? He's going to lie to you. Yeah. And he's going to say, you're not right for each other. Uh, you don't get along because you, 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 there's just too much difference between you. You never should have gotten married. Uh, it was a mistake. You, you made a mistake here. And if he can get you to believe that lie, then he's going to crumble your marriage. That's all it's going to boil down to. I, as a matter of fact, I've been counseling. I've been marriage counseling for over 40. I've been in the ministry for over 40 years. I've been counseling a lot, a lot of couples. And most couples come in, and seriously, I don't know what we think as human beings about relationships, but somehow we think that we ought to, we ought to be alike. You know, it's like they'll come in and say, well, pastor, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble with my marriage. And I said, well, what, 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 what's going on with you, brother? And uh, man, me and my wife... We just can't get along. What do you mean you can't get along? You love her, don't you? Yeah, man, I love her, but man, we're, we just don't have any. We just don't have anything in common. We're just not alike. And I go, uh, yeah, okay. What? I mean, does the fact that God made you male and female say anything to you? That everything about you is X Y, and everything about her is X X down to the chromosomes of their bodies. We are distinctly different from each other. And that if we were just exactly alike, we couldn't stand each other and we would go crazy and this would be the craziest place you've ever seen. Sure, we're different. We don't think alike. We don't talk alike. We think we speak the same language, but we don't even speak the same language. Women read code. Men are oblivious of the fact that there is code. Women are born with a satellite dish up here scanning everything. Men have rabbit ears with tinfoil. I mean, it's just everything about our life is different. So... In order for your life to be turned upside down, if the devil is going to attack you, he's going to attack you with a lie. Remember, the Bible says that he is the, the father of lies and that there is no truth in him at all. You know what that means? That means the devil not only doesn't know the truth, he can't tell the truth. Anything he will say to you is going to be a lie. And if he lies to you, he can deceive you. And that's what he did to King Darius here. He deceived him. Pride is the original sin of this world. You remember it was pride that caused Lucifer to fall out of heaven. He wanted to exalt himself and be like God. He wanted to rise his throne above God. And God banished him out of heaven so the original sin of this world and the sin of Lucifer is pride. So what does that mean about pride? It means that I am most like Lucifer when I'm filled with pride. 
Now that might sound a little strong, but no, here's another strong word. It's satanic. You know what the word satanic means? Like Satan. That's what satanic means, like Satan. To be prideful is to be like Satan. What, we, what must we do to be like God? We must be humble, right? Remember, the king of the universe was born where? In a manger, in a stable, out in the middle of nowhere, with a bunch of animals around them. I mean, my goodness. So to be more like God, we must be humble. When we are filled with pride, we're more, we're more like Lucifer. So, all right, let's look now at three lessons concerning pride. Just real quick, all right? Three lessons concerning pride. Number one, pride opens the door of your life to deception. Pride opens you up to be deceived. I'm telling you that the enemy is trying to destroy your life. He's trying to take you into captivity. He's trying to hold you in bondage. Yeah, yeah. He wants your children. He wants your job. He wants your family. He wants your home. He wants your relationships. He doesn't want you to have a happy marriage. He doesn't want you to be blessed in relationships. He wants your life topsy-turvy, all upside down. Never, n never a peaceful moment in your life. Yeah. That's what he's after. And I'm just telling you that pride is the door that opens up your life so that he can come in and, to, and deceive you. Yeah. King, look, if King Darius had not been prideful, they could have never deceived him. But because they convinced him that he was worthy of being worshipped like a god, make a proclamation that nobody for 30 days worship anybody, man or our god, other than you, O king. We're just going to bow down to you, O king, and worship you, O king. And Darius said, well, I am a pretty good king. I mean, that groovy to me. So see, if, if he wasn't prideful, he would not have been deceived. And it makes you very easily, very easily deceived when your life filled with pride. All right, let's look at verse eight. Look, verse eight. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. It just means, all right, once you sign this, king, you do know you can't go back on it, right? I mean, once you sign this, that's it. No, no change in your mind, no getting it back. And therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So he's filled with pride. Pride's got him all, uh, all uh, cooperative with this worship him deal. So where did this pride come from? Uh, does, does pride have a root? If my life is filled with pride, where, where does pride come from? I mean, what, what, what's the root? What's the root of pride? If we're, gonna, if we're gonna kill the tree of pride in our life, what does, what's the root? How can we get to the root? Well, I'm gonna submit to you that the root of pride is insecurity. When you are insecure, you're prideful. And I wanna just share this with you. Now, this does not come out of the Bible, so don't talk to Jesus about it one day when you get to heaven. And say, my pastor told me this is what happened. Because I'm just telling you, I'm reading, there's a couple of secular historians, which are very highly favored, uh, Greek, uh, one Greek and one uh, uh, Persian, historian that have written about the times, and the information I'm about to share with you comes from that. But I'm just going to use it to show you the root of insecurity that's in Darius's life. All right, Darius is a Mede, a Mede, not a Persian. Now, this is important to know because the Persians were powerful and strong, and they took over the world at that time. The Medes attached themselves to the Persians and became their allies because they didn't want to be taken by the Persians. So to be a Mede was... Uh, a little lower status than to be a mighty Persian. Cyrus the Great, that we'll look at next week, is a Persian. 
but Darius is a Mede. Now, if you start trying to study this in history, let me tell you what you're going to find. You're going to find a lot of information about another king named Darius, Darius the first or Darius the great, and this is not Darius the Mede. That Darius is a Persian, and he takes over the empire probably about 15, 20 years from now. If you're going to try to find this in Google or whatever, it, you need to find Darius the Mede, the Mede. So anyway, Darius the Mede is really a general under Cyrus the Great, and they have been attacking Babylonia, and they're trying to take the whole kingdom and so forth. And, and Darius is really a great general, and he does a lot of uh, work in Babylonia. Well, one day when he's on his way to the city of Babylon, they've got it surrounded, and they've got it surrounded, so they've besieged it, but they can't take it because they can't get inside of it because Babylon is surrounded by giant walls. I mean, giant and real thick, like the city of Jericho. You remember, God had to tear those walls down. Well, Bab Babylon, the city of Babylon is like that, and it has the Euphrates River running right straight through the middle of it. So they can stay in there forever. They have all the water they want. They're self-contained. And though an army could besiege the city, they couldn't take it because they can't get inside to, to, to take it. Well, Darius is on his way with some of his men, and he's coming through Turkey, and there's a river in Turkey called the Gadiz River, G-E-D-I-Z, the Gadiz River. And, 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 and Darius is on a stallion. He, he, he runs his horse out into the Gadiz, and the water is so swift that it takes him and his horse down the river, this stallion, and, and drowns his horse, and, kill, and Darius you know, makes out alive. But he, when he gets on the bank, he said, man, he said, this is ridiculous. He said, I want this river where women and children can walk across it. So his army then takes on an engineering project where he starts digging canals off of the Gadiz River and diverting the water so that the water in the river slowly goes down and they can traverse the thing and it's not swift anymore. And I'm just telling you that to say that he learned a lesson on that. He learned a lesson about how to take really great rivers and to divert them down and to be able to take the water level down and so forth. He needs this information. Why? Because, remember, the city of Babylon has the Euphrates River running right straight through it. And the reason nobody can ever get in is because the river's so high that you can't get under the wall. You can't, certainly can't bring an army under the wall. And there's no way in. The walls are too high. The walls are too thick. The river's too fast, too swift, too deep. So when Darius gets to the city of Babylon, Cyrus the Great and all the armies of Persia have it surrounded. I mean, they've, they've enclosed it, but they can't take it because they can't get in there. Darius says, hey, let me tell you what I did back here at the Gadiz. I had my men dig some canals and it diverted the water. And you know, there's a marsh right down there. And if you look on maps, You'll see near the old city of Babylon, there's a giant marsh area out there. I mean, it's even written, big enough to be written on maps, marsh land. And what he did is he took canals, he took his men and he dug canals off the Euphrates and diverted it, some of the water into that marsh land out there. And the Euphrates River went down so slowly, just went down slowly, slowly, so slowly that the citizens of Babylon didn't notice that it was going down, down, down. And then when it reached the final point low enough, the army of the Babylon, Babylonians, I mean the army of the Persians walked right into the city of Babylon and took it without even having to fight for it. And Darius the Mede was the general who did it and Cyrus the king made him the king and said, okay, I'm gonna let you be the king of Babylon because uh, you deserve it, man. That, that was brilliant. That was, that was genius. Well, Darius was in the city the night the hand wrote on the plaster of the temple wall. And of course, Belshazzar, the king, knees knocking, petrified. That happened in the temple. Belshazzar is scared to death for his life. He leaves the temple and he goes to the palace where he lives. He tells the guards at the temple, do not let anybody back into this temple. Do not, it, it, I don't care who it is, don't let them in. If they tell you that it's, even if they say, it's the king, let me in. Don't, you, don't let them in, kill that person. Well, that night he gets sick. Belshazzar gets physically sick. He goes out the back door of the palace he, when he tries to come back in, the guards are there, 
And the guards say, ho, oh, who is it? And he said, man, I'm the king. Let me back in. That. And they said, well, you know, the king just told us that if anybody came up here, even if they said they're the king, we're to kill them. And when Darius heard that, Darius took a candelabra and crushed the head of Belshazzar right there on the job. And Belshazzar died right there. And Darius the Mede became the king. Now, all I'm saying to you is, because Darius was not the real king, he was a mead, uh -huh. low class, yeah, yeah. Not, not as powerful as the Persians. He was only there because the Persian king put him there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just submitting to you that that put insecurity in Darius's life. Darius felt like he was not really the man. And he, and he was insecure about his position, insecure about his life, and the devil saw that as an opportunity to create uh, bondage in Darius' life and swole him up with pride so that he could be the man. Oh yeah, hey, if I get him to worship me, oh. It is me. I deserve this. This is a great thing. And so Darius is an easy target for deception because of his insecurity. Now, I mean, I don't know if this is saying anything to anybody, but I'm telling you that insecurity in your life will open you up to be deceived for the enemy to come into your life and just have a whale of a time. And I don't care how many counselors get a hold of you. I don't care how many advisors get a hold of you, how many friends get a hold of you. Uh, this is a bondage. This is a captivity. And it's all caused by an open door in your life that pride opened you up to the deception. Look at verse 10, chapter 6. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Mm -hmm. So Daniel knows what the thing, what the decree says and he doesn't do anything different. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to show him something and then go do something he didn't do. He did this every day. He did not do anything that he didn't do every day. So what did he do? He went home and he opened his windows toward Jerusalem. By the way, do any of you know why Jews always pray toward Jerusalem? Would you like to know? It'd be nice if there was a verse in the Bible that'd tell you that, right? All right, 1 Kings chapter 8, put it up there, 10. This is King Solomon. King Solomon is praying for the temple. The King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. The temple's being dedicated in Jerusalem. King Solomon is praying a prayer to dedicate the temple. It's a big, long prayer, really. He's a long-winded preacher. I, I, I can identify with him. Long-winded preacher. And this is one of the things he says in his prayer. It's verse 35. Solomon's praying, and Solomon says, if the skies are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you, and if they pray toward this temple and acknowledge your name and turn from their sins because you have punished them, then hear from heaven and forgive your, the sins of your servants, your people Israel. See, the reason they pray toward Jerusalem is because Solomon said, boy, when times are hard and when things are tough, turn toward this temple and pray and ask God. You know, and, and, and so that became what they all did. They prayed toward the temple in Jerusalem every day. And he prayed three times a day. Why did he pray three times a day? Would there, there might be another verse that would tell us that. Psalm 55, here's David, King David, verse 17. He says, morning, noon, and night, I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. They pray three times a day because David taught them to pray three times a day. That's what David did. They said, if it's good enough for David, it's good enough for us. If it's good enough for Solomon to pray, and God do, God hear, it's good enough for me. Now, remember, the burden of this series is God is trying to correct us. And while God is trying to correct us, Satan is trying to destroy us. And he's always on the attack and he's always trying to take us into bondage. So how did Daniel, how did Daniel keep from falling into pride? 
Because I don't know about you, but I think Daniel had some things to be proud of. I mean, who, who could tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream and then tell him what it meant except Daniel? I, I, I mean, who could, who could read the handwriting on the wall and tell Belshazzar that the kingdom was about to be taken from him? I mean, who had friends like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that could go down in a fiery furnace and come out and not even have a hair singed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How could Daniel was the highest governor in the kingdom. He was second only to the king. He found favor with all four kings of Babylon, pagans. Everybody loved Daniel. Daniel was highly favored in every way. And I'm just saying that Daniel had a lot to be proud of. And I would like to say, how did he keep from falling into pride like all the rest of, the, of these people did? And it's a very simple answer. He knew the word of God. Now I'm telling you, the word of God is the power of God. If I had my Bible and not just something on the on screen up here, I'd hold him up. And I'd tell you that this is the Word of God. This is the power of God. This is God's voice. This is God. He gave this to us to guide us, to lead us, to speak to us, to empower us, to embolden us. It's the Word of God. And the reason Daniel didn't fall to pride is because Daniel knew the Word of God. How did he know to pray toward Jerusalem? Well, when he was reading 1 Kings, he read about Solomon praying toward Jerusalem. That's how he knew. How did he know about praying three times a day? Well, when he was reading the book of Psalms, he read what David said, and, and he, that's how he knew to pray three times a day. I'm telling you, it's God's Word that will keep us free. And it's, it's, a tool, it's the power of God. All right, let me go on. Let me go on. Lesson number one, pride opens the door to deception. Lesson number two, pride always brings regret. Always regret. You do something with pride, you're going to regret it. You let pride take you somewhere, make you do something. I say make you, encourage you to do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You let it do that, it, it, you're going to regret it. King Darius does everything he can to try to get that decree turned around. Because now he finds out... Uh, I got to throw Daniel in the lion's den. My, 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 my man, my, 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 my buddy, my partner, my, the, only, the only person in this whole kingdom I even believe in. The one that no bad thing can be said about, no fault found in him. I mean, Daniel's got to go in the lion's den? How stupid am I? What in the, how did that happen to me? What in the world? And he tries everything he can to get that decree reversed, but he can't get it reversed because it's the law of the Medes and Persians that once is signed by the king, it can't be undone. And so from the very moment he does this, he regrets his decision. But it's too late. He's already done it. Verse 16. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he'll deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So nobody could come get him out of there. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And this wasn't spiritual. He's not a Christian. <laughs> this is not spiritual fasting. It mean, that means he, he, he couldn't eat. He was so upset, so torn up, he couldn't eat. Spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. In other words, didn't turn on TV, didn't want any entertainment. And also his sleep went from him. So the king spends a sleepless night worried about Daniel. Matter of fact, the only person that slept that night was Daniel. Uh, lions, <laughs> lions just kind of roam around protecting him. Daniel sleep on the floor. King wake. Everybody wake. Only person that got a good night's sleep was Daniel. But I, I, 
I'm just using this passage to show you that when we make decisions based on pride or based on insecurity that, and not based upon principle, because principle comes from the Word of God. You make decisions based on a principle. Well, that principle comes from the Word of God. But if you make decisions based on pride or insecurity, you're going to regret it. And I'm speaking as an expert about this, sad to say. Uh, sad to say, I've made many decisions like this. I'm not proud of them. I'm, kinda, I'm really sad about it. But I've made many prideful decisions in my life. Decisions where I didn't ask God what to do about anything. I just did it because it made me feel good. It met some need in my life. Hey, I'm telling you, when you're a young preacher, you start when you're 18 years old, you come from a dirt poor family in a dirt backwards place, and a, a, you, know, you, you don't have any wisdom, any knowledge, any training, you get saved when you're 16, you fill with insecurity. Your name is insecurity. And also, uh, you're not only insecure, you know, you, you, you're... Um, you're just you're challenged within yourself about your own sense of self-worth. You become a sitting duck. I'm telling you, I did many things. I, I used to, when I was young, uh, pastor, I used to preach everywhere. I used to have so many invitations. People asked me to preach, uh, you know, because I was a little young. I was a young preacher boy. And, you know, that's kind of a novel thing when you're real young like that. And they'd come and ask me to speak to their young people. They'd do Valentine's banquets, all kind of stuff. I'd come do youth revivals and youth this and youth that. Uh, Tanya would go with me and play the piano. We didn't have soundtracks back then, all that kind of stuff. And, that's how we actually got together, actually. Of course, we're from the same church, but you know, she was just a kid and you're too young for me. But uh, <laughs> she worked her way in. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but anyway, I would go, I'm telling you, I would take somebody would call me and say, Would you come and speak to our we we need we got we want to have a revival on the third Sunday of July. Would you come pre be our revival preacher? Man, I would take it in a heartbeat. You know why? Because it fed something on the inside of me. It fed my insecurity. It felt my sense of worthlessness. It said, you're worth something. You're pretty good. See, it's pride. It's pride. pride. Yeah, they want you to come, so they think you're good. So that means you're good. And see, it just, and, and I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I got to certain places, and during that week when I was supposed to be, I mean, I'm preaching, doing all these kind of things, that I would ask myself, why in the world did you do this? Why did you do this? And the only answer was, I didn't ask God. I didn't go to God and say, God, should I do this? Should, should I take this opportunity to speak? Is this from you? Is this what you want in my life? No, 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 no. Oh, didn't ask God about anything. I just did it because I needed a fix in my life and this was a fix. Pride, man, that's all it is. And when you, when you act out of pride or insecurity, you're gonna regret it. Cause pride brings regret. All right, third thing real quick. Pride causes spiritual blindness. All right, it opens you up to deception. It causes regret, cause you're gonna do something you're gonna regret. And then it, it makes you blind spiritually. All right, let me show you. All right, this is how you get deceived. This is how pride works. This is how he does it. He creates blindness, spiritual blindness in you so that you can't see in the spirit anymore. How many of you see in the spirit at all? Let me just see you. You see anything in the spirit? All right, now I'm not talking about you see ghosts or you know, you see some, some, uh, uh, something that's not there. I'm not talking about being spooky now. I'm talking about that the Holy Spirit lives in you and when you approach a situation or something, something inside you starts alarming and saying, you don't, don't be that. Uh -uh. Well, that's, that's spiritual sight. That's, that's, that's spiritual sight. When you're filled with pride, you lose that. That goes away. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, 
Has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh, king, live forever. <laughs> I can imagine. Boy, can you imagine what hit Darius' heart when he heard, O oh, king, live forever. Man, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they've not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O oh, king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. But that's not all. This is what we want to happen to everybody that, that misuses us right here. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the lion's den and their children and their wives. Oh, that just shows you that your sin hurts other people too, okay. Uh, and, and, and the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. You know why they, he told you that last little line? So you would know that those lions weren't tame. Daniel didn't get thrown into a den of tame lions, nor did he get thrown into a den of lions that got fed yesterday. Because I don't know if you know this, but in all my research about lions, you know, we were talking about the, the roaring lion, Satan being a roaring lion. I found out it took a long, it takes a long time for lions' food to digest. Like they eat today, it might take three or four days before their food digests and they're hungry again. It's just the way they are. Well, these lions, <laughs> These lions hadn't been fed yesterday. <laughs> so Daniel was in there with those lions that, were, that tore those people up and broke them in pieces and devoured them before they ever even hit the floor of the, of the lions then. Man, I'm telling you, good night. And the moment Darius saw this miracle and received it as the work of God, the blinders came off of his spirit and he saw the deception as it was and he got the men that did it and he threw them in the den and was done with them. But before he saw this as God and opened his eyes to the Spirit, he never would have seen this. He would have been deceived his whole life, spiritual blindness. Let me give you the clearest picture of spiritual blindness in the Bible. And I'm just going to read some scripture, and it's a little bit lengthy, but I'm going to go through it fast because I want to get to the right at the end because I want you to see what I'm talking about, about the spiritual blindness stuff, all right? So hang with me. I'm going to move. All right, I'm moving. John 9, John 9, verse 1. By the way, this is not the guy that cried out, Jesus, heal me, blind Bartimaeus. No, this guy didn't say a word to Jesus. He's sitting on the side of the road. He's been born blind, which means probably he doesn't even have any eyes, doesn't even have any eye sockets. He's born blind, didn't get hurt, born blind, just sitting there beside the road, not saying a word. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, that's pride right there. That's all that is, just pure pride. If you look, listen, if you look at weakness and sickness in another person and you conclude that that weakness or that sickness is because of some personal sin of theirs or their parents, that is nothing but legalistic judgmentalism. Where you're making a judgment and you're saying, man, if they were as good as me, they wouldn't be blind like that. What did they do that made them blind? Did their parents sin or did he sin? I'm thinking, what could he do in the womb? It's just ridiculous. See, sin makes you dumb, right? And, and Jesus corrects him, verse 8, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the work. Now, Jesus is just talking. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day because night's coming and no one can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. All right, nobody disagreed with that. That's wonderful. It's a beautiful statement. Poetic, has great, all of that. Verse six, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground. That, you don't think about Jesus spitting, do you? You don't think about Jesus sitting there going, <laughs> I mean, that, that's nobody's picture of Jesus, right? All right. Yeah. What, well, what did he do? <laughs> when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with the saliva. 
and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He spits, gets down there, daubs around in it, makes clay out of the spit, and, the, and then takes it and puts it on the man's eye. All right. And he said to him, verse 7, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. All right, does that change things for you? I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that Jesus would spit and play in the mud. I mean, that's kind of uncouth, right? I mean, sophisticated people would get upset about that, right? I mean, that, that would offend you, right? You, Jesus spits and, you, and, then, and then somebody says, you know, he puts it on it and somebody says, hey, you know what he just did to you? <laughs> the eye takes off. He just spit in your eye. Uh, all right, that would get people upset. You know, I mean, classy people don't, don't, they don't walk around with people that spit on the ground and do stuff like this. This is an uncool deal. But the fact that he came back seeing, now that makes all the difference in the world, right? All of a sudden, man, hey, it doesn't matter about what he did. That guy can see. All right, now let's keep on going. Uh, now watch all this conversation that starts taking place. This is like uh, social media of, of Jesus' day right here. This is the Twitter sphere and the Facebook and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, TikTok and all that other, whatever, all that stuff here. All right. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that, that he was blind said... Is not this he who sat and begged? I mean, it, hey, isn't that that guy that sees, sits out here and begs all the time? And some said, this is he. And others said, well, he looks like him. Uh, and, and then the guy said, I, I'm he. I, I'm, I, I'm the one. <laughs> then they said to him, how were your eyes opened? And he answered and he said, well, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, go, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. Then they said to him, well, where is he? And he said, man, I don't know. I was blind. You know, I don't even know what he looks like. You know? I mean, come on, man. I've never seen him. He put the mud on me and sent me down to the pool. And when I came back, he, I mean, he might be standing right here. I don't even know him because I've never seen him. I'm blind. Now he gets in some real trouble now because here comes the religious crowd. These Pharisees. Now remember, just keep in the back of your mind, this man did not ask for this. This man did not ask Jesus to heal him. This man did not say anything to make Jesus do this. Jesus just saw him, said, put the mud, go wash. He did it. Now he's healed. That's, that's all this man knows. All right. Verse 13. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Uh-oh. Now it was a Sabbath. Of course. Of course it had to be a Sabbath, right? Had to be, he had to break some law, some religious law. Can't work on the Sabbath and spitting in mud and putting it on a man's eyes and doctoring somebody is working to the Jewish people. So it's a Sabbath, you broke the Sabbath. And it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I wash and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man's not of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And others said, well, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Yeah. I mean, they can't even get along with each other. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? And he said, well, I think he's a prophet. Hey, he doesn't know. He did, he's got power is all I'm telling you. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. They say, this is a trick. He didn't, he wasn't really blind. He says, a until they called his par the parents of him who had received his sight. Now they're bringing mom and daddy in. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered them and said, we, we know that this is our son. And we know that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. 
His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had, had agreed already that if anybody confessed that he was Christ, that Jesus was Christ, they would put him out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. The, parents, uh, the, the Pharisee has, have already decided if, if one of those people say Jesus did this and Jesus is the Christ, that they're going to kick him out of the temple. I mean, when in doubt, kick him out. Is, I mean, is, right. That's what religion does. Religion is good at kicking people out of stuff. Verse 24, so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. Give glory to God. We know that this man's a sinner. He answered and said, now this is something, I'm going to tell you, any person in this room, this, you can do this right here. Now, you can get asked all kind of questions by all kind of silly people who think they're smart. How many, how many angels can dance on the head of a needle? Uh, you know, where did Lot's wife come from? I mean, just, you know, all kind of just questions. And you, and you don't know. And I don't know. No, but here, when, you, when somebody asks you some ridiculous question, what happened to the dinosaurs? You know, all kind of stuff like that. Here, you may not know the answer to any of that, but here's what you can say. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. I don't know where the, where the dinosaurs came from. I don't know about global warming. I don't know about the end of the age. I don't know any of that stuff. All I know is I used to be blind, uh, but now I see. And that's the only thing that's important, guys, seriously. Because all the rest of it is God's hands, and he's got it worked out. You're not going to do anything about it anyway. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said to them, I told you already, and you did not listen. <laughs> now, this is when he gets in some real trouble, because I don't know if you ever know this, but Pharisees do not have an overwhelming sense of uh, humor. <laughs> this, is a, this is a humorous thing, he says to them. But they don't, look, religious people, they ain't got a sense of humor. Um, where, how did you do And he said, all right, I told you already, you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? <laughs> Oops. Then they reviled him. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying they got real hot about it. <laughs> then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's even from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he's from, yet he opened my eyes. <laughs> that's, that, that's really comical. Uh, let me just tell you what it, that's happened right there. The Pharisees knew everything about God. That's what they said. The Pharisees were the rulers of the world for things of God. And the Pharisees just said, we don't even know where he's from. And, I, and, the, and the blind man said, well, that's a miracle because you don't even know where he's from and you're supposed to be the keeper of the keys to the kingdom of God and he just healed my life. And you don't even know where he's from. Boy, that was a slap. They might not better best with that little fellow. He's got some insight here. And uh, now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him since the world began. It has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he, couldn't, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you're teaching us? And they cast him out. They threw him out of church. Now, here's true vision and true blindness right here. I did all that to get to these verses. I just want you to appreciate it when we get there. <laughs> Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, in other words, when Jesus heard that they cast him out of the temple, Jesus went looking for him. Which means when you get thrown away, Jesus is going to come find you. Jesus looks for you. He said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? 
And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him and it is he who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may be made blind. I'll tell you what that means in just a second. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words. They're always listening. You know, they heard him say that. And they asked him, well, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say you see, your sins remain. Jesus is saying, if you would just admit that you can't see without me, if you would just humble yourself, come off of that high horse you own, and admit that without me, you can see nothing in life, I would take the sins from your life remove them as far as the east is from the west, and you would have no sin anymore in your life. But since you're so full of pride and so haughty, and you say you don't need me to be able to see, you can see without me, then your sins remain. I'm not forgiving you. I'm not taking away your sin. As long as you keep that prideful, stubborn attitude, walk it yourself. That's what it takes. That, that's spiritual blindness. When you can't see your need for him. It doesn't matter how much you read. It doesn't have, matter how much you know. Without him, you're blind. And Jesus said, if you were blind, man, I could forgive your sin. But because you say you don't need me and I, you see anyway, then your sin remains. You settle in your own faith. Listen, one, one other little thought. Uh, back in the 80s, I can't, I think like it was around the middle 80s, maybe 86 or so, 87. Uh, 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 a real giant in, um, in TV uh, evangelist ministry uh, fell. Um, and it was just broadcast and publicized everywhere. I mean, it was a big, big deal, big deal. About about three months before he fell, I was watching him on TV. I had a big nationwide deal going on. And I heard him make this statement. He said, I have been told, this is what he was saying on TV, not everybody. He said, I have been told that we are now the largest Christian television ministry in the world. So when you give to us, you're going to be given to the biggest and the best ministry in the world. And when I heard that, man, a, a tinge went up, up, up and down my spine because I actually thought this, Lord, I, 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 I pray for him because this is one of the most arrogant statements that I believe I've ever heard a man make. And I also pray for myself. I said, Lord, my, my goodness, I don't ever want to be so full of pride and arrogance that I would think something like that. Lord, help me that, that, that I might not be. Well, months later, months later, it was revealed that, that this man had some moral issues in his life and he, and he fell. He lost, he lost his ministry. And of course, everybody was talking about it. Secular people and Christian people, everybody was just talking about it. Did you hear about his fall? Did you hear about what happened? And he fell, and he fell. And I thought to myself, well, I heard about his fall, but his sin was pride. He fell because of immorality. But his sin was pride. Pride is a dangerous 
sin is so subtle, it's so insidious, it flies under the radar, but it's deadly. So let, let's just bow our head real quick.